Welcome to Crimson Guitars. This is another tutorial following the installation of a new XY MIDI pad kit from Amptone Lab into a guitar. I build custom guitars, I teach how to build custom guitars. I always wondered how good I could take a very cheap kit guitar. And that's what we're doing at the moment. This is an 80 pounds Telecaster and it was not very good and we've put a new top on it and we're binding it and we're, we're expanding all the hardware and uh, I think we're going to end up making a very very cool guitar but with one of these things you can control a chaos pad for example that's the most common thing a Digitech whammy or even you could plug this into your computer and control any number of uh, VSTs um, your virtual studio and, well, anything. Keyboards, MIDI, anything that can be controlled via MIDI, you can control with this. And uh, it opens up a whole host of possibilities to a guitarist or bass player. With complex electronics, the less thinking you have to do, the better, quite frankly. And the beauty of the Amtone Lab Kit is, it is plug and play entirely. The amount of times we sell replacement screens for people who've tried to put this onto a curved top and thought the glass bends. Uh, well, don't do it unless you want to uh, come back to Crimson Guitars and buy some more screens. Tools that you're going to need. Very basic. A nice router, a bearing cutter and a screwdriver, pretty much. We're going to go through the tutorial now and see See what you think. Very briefly, check out my YouTube channel. There are videos going into great depth on how to hook up one of these pads to your, uh, to your rig. Well, I'm going to stop whittling on and let's start the installation process. So we're at the next stage. I've still got the cheap pickup that came with the kit. How we just put it into the better quality bridge system that we're using. The next stage is that Howard needs to figure out exactly where the bridge is going to sit. Now we'll be putting the neck in place. So we need to know where we're going. This is potentially a three-body stringing guitar. I'm not sure which one I wanted it to go now, actually. We need to get the neck fitted, so I'm gonna to have to adjust the corners of this so that they fit into that badly routed slot. Yeah, once we're able to put the neck in place then we can figure out where the bridge needs to be so that we can calculate the scale length and position the bridge correctly before get the templates in place and route the custom cavities for the XY and its controller. Got the neck in place, we need to figure out what scale it is. We've got someone else's fret ruler here and um, we're gonna Check. This is 25.5 ruler. So, if we have a look. And 25.5 is what this neck is supposed to be. And actually, when you get down to 21, it's hanging off the end of the fret. So, it's not quite 25.5. So, I'm going to measure to 12th fret. And then we can just double that and we'll know what the scale actually is. That is 323. Effectively, this scale length is shorter than it should be, but at least it is still a scale length and they have used a formula to arrive at the fret positions. But what it does show you is that you cannot just trust the people that have made this to have stuck with the conventions and made it the correct scale length. Uh, double check, triple check, measure, measure, cut. Uh, because if I had put this in, or if you had this instrument, uh, just as a kit guitar, without even trying to upgrade anything, if you had put your bridge in the right place, it would have been in the wrong place. Back to Howard, and he's going to find out where the bridge should be.
we've just increased the depth of the top by a top. <laughs> the neck is too too deep inside the pocket. Now, pass me the bit of wood. We have got a bit of wood left over from the neck and the top. Uh, sorry, the top. And we're going to have to put that on the heel of the neck joint underneath there to raise it up. And, uh, and that's how it's next job. Once I know where my bridge is going to be, and you will more than likely than not know where yours is because uh, I suspect you'll be installing this on a pre-made guitar, you want to find out where your screen is going to go. And I'm not too worried about the center, the position based on the center line at the moment. I'm worried about the gap between the binding and the gap between the bridge and the surround. So I'm going to draw a line in here. If you're working on a guitar that is already made, you obviously don't want to draw lines, at least on the outside, where you're not going to route. What I would suggest doing is getting some masking tape and putting a strip of masking tape, as long as the masking tape doesn't react with your particular finish. Be a bit wary of nitro, etc. Now the initial cavity that we're going to be routing is to recess the screen. And it's only going to be, well, nominally two mil deep, but uh, I would say closer to 1.7. And now I'm using my eyes. I can see those, the internal lines there, and I'm using my eyes to say, okay, fine, that is now centered. I've got my center line based on the center line on the guitar. And And we can work that out properly. And that cavity is going to be for the whole control system. That goes in there. All we need to do now is just completely make certain we're in the right position and then mark our four holes. Now, as well as holding the templates down, those four holes within the end, pull down the cover. So, as with everything building related, uh, guitar building related at least, measure, measure, cut. Just absolutely make doubly sure and entirely certain, certain you're in the right place. This ash top we've put on here is rather hard. There we go. Now those will ensure that everything goes in the correct place. Now to the pre-drilling. Forstner bits are wonderful. They cut very cleanly as they go in and because they've got that centered spur, I suppose, and it's not very deep, you can cut a nice wide hole uh, in a guitar. The most important reason for doing this is to make life easier on your router and router bit. If you're going to route out a cavity that big with just a router bit without pre-drilling it, you're taking away way too much material and it's going to dull the bit, it's going to heat up and pushing a router sideways through wood is much harder than letting a pillar drill just pull it all out of there for you. And uh, it means that you're less likely to make a mistake. The main trick with Forstner bits is to Take it slow.
when you're cutting the next hole, overlap the first one and it'll make the cut easier. Now I've set my depth stop to 22 millimeters. The minimum depth for this cavity, this is the central cavity, is 18 millimeters. Uh, to my mind, if you've got more space, use it. It will spread the glow of the LED further and uh, I think look better. But you could fit it into an 18 mil cavity if necessary. Onwards and upwards. Before we get routing, we have to locate the templates, obviously, and uh, always pre-drill any hole that you're going to screw into in a guitar. Needless to say, precision is absolutely essential. This is why we worry about center lines so much. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Get everything ready beforehand and you'll be sorted. Oh, wrong way. So it's lined up to my lines that I drew earlier. It's lined up to the center line and my holes line up. So I've triple checked. Let me go find a router. If you're doing this, you obviously have experience with a router. If not, practice before you cut into your guitar. And, uh, and make absolutely certain to clamp it down securely. We're currently about to route out the, the bigger cavity, which is only going to be less than two millimeters deep. With, with normal routers, you, you go up and down and, and lock it off with, a, with one of those and hope. Uh, with the Triton router, once it's in place, you've got several rack and pinion ways to adjust the height. And one of them, and the reason I've got these, is this fine adjustment, which goes down in minuscule increments, which means that I can precisely judge the depth of cut that I want. Initially, you need to use your router's adjustment, whatever that happens to be, to put the router bit just at the level of the top of the guitar. And then you can use depth stops, etc., to, to make sure that you don't go deeper than you want. It would be an absolute disaster. If the glass is sitting loose in that route between the wood and your frame, then, well, the last thing you want on a guitar is a bit of rattly glass rattling around and potentially breaking. Now, when I move over the cavity and go down, I can't go any deeper than that. I am, however, going to start higher and I'm gonna use the fine adjustment on this router because I have it. And I'm gonna go down in, a, in increments to make sure that I get it absolutely perfectly to depth. Do not forget safety gear. Uh, eye protection, this router's got a shield, etc, but uh, yeah, don't trust anything. 
and uh, we're musicians, we all are, ear defenders. Now I'm going to take this absolutely slow, figure out where I am. I'm taking about a millimetre cut to start and then we'll go from there. Set of calipers and just make absolutely certain through any production process the companies change and each batch of these touch screens might vary. So if I say 1.7 mil, don't believe me, double check for yourself. And as I'm talking, I'm trying to read numbers, this one here is 1.5 millimeters. So we've got our set of calipers, out of the bottom comes that little notch, notch, out of the bottom comes that. And that is what I'm using to measure the depth of my cut. I still have about a half a millimetre to go, so back on with the safety gear and back on with my router. I've got a little bit over. And there we have it. So now I can actually go into the cavity area and route as much as I want. And it's as easy as that. One pass and we have a recess. Just triple check where I can. So next stage is to remove this, put the smaller one on and route out the central cavity, which the dimensions of are much less uh, critical, shall we say. Lovely. While I'm demonstrating this and touching the cutter, I have unplugged the machine. Uh, anyhow, now I need to put on a deeper cutter so that my collet isn't hitting the template. And another beautiful thing about the Triton router, that is now automatically locked in place. So anyway, I'm going to change this cutter over and drop my spanner and then we can start well finish routing our cavity the depth of this cavity needs to be at least 18 millimeters as I said I think earlier because I've just taken two millimeters away where my pillar drill uh, has ended up as being 16 millimeters deeper than the bottom of the screen's cavity. I want a 20 millimeter deep cavity. So, same thing again. I need to find where my hole stops and then set this to 20. And then it's literally just a case of using my bearing cutter to route away all the excess. And it's going to be a pretty damn easy job because, uh, well, we've got rid of all the excess already. the bulk of the routing done and uh, well I'm adding new electronics in here so you need to be aware that you're probably going to have to enlarge your guitar's control cavity before I go on I want to double check my screen see that I've got the depth right and all of that 
At this stage, it's worth saying that, okay, be careful with glass, for one. Oh, there we go. Did you know that if your finger was the size of the planet Earth, we are so sensitive that we can tell the difference between houses and cars at that scale. And uh, this glass is exactly the right depth. I'm going to have to cut away some corners so that it fits in perfectly. But uh, that's what chisels are for. I'm going to have to route another cavity for the controls and one for the battery box as well. And I'm going to have to drill access holes and all of that loveliness. I've already got a deep cutter in it. And as luck would have it, I've already got a very old template. No matter how many pencils you have, you always lose them. I suspect that's right. Nope, not right. I'm just putting an extra offset control cavity there. So that's the one I want. Ah, that is large enough that I am going to go back to the pillar drill and pre-drill. Well, you can use a stand hand drill to pre-drill your cavities. A pillar drill is better for several reasons. You can set it to go slower, which uh, means that your force the bit isn't going to overheat and burn. And uh, most pillar drills have a depth stop as well. So that you can be absolutely certain you're going to the right depth and you're not going to cut through the back of your guitar because that would be bad. We've done the pre-drilling and the lovely useful pillar drill and the time has come for templates. You need to be absolutely aware of the size or the footprint of your router. You don't want it, you don't want the base of the router to hit the foot of your clamp or any part of your clamp for that matter. Success! Progress! There we have it. Time to drill some holes. Long drill bits. We have several options. Let's play. I'm going to be using this one for the most part if I need a particularly long drill bit, which I do cut in that angle. So, because of one very important fact, and that very important fact is, oh, let's be organized, let's be organized, chop, 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 chop. That's rather large. So those fittings need to fit through whatever hole I create. And uh, that means that I'm going to be either using a Forstner bit or a flat bit. These are useful for routing, for drilling, wiring cavities, etc. Flat bit. And that sits in there. The hex head closes and we have a super long drill bit. These are available all over the place. That feeling when a drill bit is just about to go out the other side. I love the subtleties of each different tool we use. <laughs> the drill bit's bigger <laughs> than the tool I'm using. I've been talking about a battery box from, from the start. And I now find myself in a, in a quandary. Uh, this guitar is a scratch plate and a, a control plate that are mounted on the front and having a single battery box somewhere on here it, it slightly offends me it, it just doesn't look it just doesn't look right so 
Because I know that this system uses not very much battery at all, and because this control plate only has a couple of screws, I'm going to install the battery for this one inside the cavity. And, uh, and I'm not going to be guilty about that. If, you, if I had an instrument with a rear control plate, uh, or back plate it would be called if it's on the rear, what I often do is actually just recess this into the plate itself. Well, this is the joy of guitars and guitar building. Every single instrument is different and uh, you, can, you can do whatever you want, frankly. Uh, so in this case, where are we? We've done all the routing, we've drilled the, the wiring routing. Other people have guitars that have controls that are mounted through the top as opposed to on a scratch plate or control plate. You're not silly. You're watching this for a reason. You want to do this sort of a job. So what you would need to do is work out where you want the controls to be, drill those holes, and then use those holes to figure out from the back what shape or how much bigger your control cavity needs to be. I did a video demonstrating this much earlier. Uh, in a much rougher way and I think that that instrument had controls that were mounted through the back and uh, if you want you can check that one out. Now the final stage before we go and do the finishing on this guitar and then eventually install is making sure that this screen fits perfectly. And what I'm going to have to do for that is just nip away with a properly sharp chisel the corners so that it sits and it doesn't move either way. Center the glass. You need to bear in mind that the working part of this touch screen needs to be but it needs to be centered, it needs to be in the middle. And I'm going to use a sharp pencil, or you could use a braddle. Okay. The glass has just snapped at the tip of my erstwhile sharp pencil. And then I'm going to use a sharp chisel to chop those out. Being careful not to break my glass course. And if I've done my job properly, let's see. I love ribbon cables. Look at that, it just falls right over. That sits there. There is no movement up or down or sideways. Uh, and that is well, that's important, really. So, uh, there we have it. Remember that in the end, we're gonna have this piece of white. It's a diffuser that goes behind the glass. And uh, this is all going to look really rather lovely. Now I'm going to leave you and we're gonna send this guitar away to the other bench and it's going to be spine sanded and finished and uh, oiled and sprayed and all that sort of stuff. Do you get the impression I don't know what we're doing yet? And uh, we will be back to do the installation later. I felt that this little bit of plastic was a bit little and plasticky. So I'm going to make something a little bit nicer uh, using this piece of Macasa Rebony. Now I'm not going to leave this uh, a boring flat pickups around. There's going to be carving and, and racing stripes. I've been wanting to do this for years. It's the smallest little details that take a guitar from the ordinary to the extraordinary. Oh that sounds so cliched. So here is my new pickups around. I've been tweeting the photos as I do on Facebook and Twitter and all that 
Normally, I would say do the wiring with the pots and switches, etc. actually in the scratch plate. In this case, that's not viable because I'm going to be installing the XY MIDI pad stuff in that same scratch plate. So I'm going to figure out where the holes need to go on that. And I've also realized that I haven't yet drilled the access hole for the MIDI output, which I really should have done. But then again, this guitar is now in the state in which your guitar probably is, i.e. finished. The MIDI out takes a 15 millimeter drill bit. I use Forstner bits because, because I like Forstner bits for this job. Anyhow, let us continue drilling. So just for fun, I'm going to center this on the body joint. Remember that this guitar is not a proper Crimson custom guitar. This is a kit guitar that our apprentice is upgrading just to see how far one could take a really cheap kit. Now I don't need to go all the way through with the 15 mil, so that's not so deep. Although I might. Let's move some of the electronics out of the way. There we go. This seems to take much more thought for me than most other facets of this, uh, this whole process. I've decided that I'm going to have the standard telecontrols along the bottom bit because, as I say in the article, you want to have access to the hold button uh, as much as possible. Some people put it up here, so you can hit it with your thumb and play. I'll put it there, tap, play. It's quite, it's close and it's close enough. Now, so there we go, I'm gonna have the hold button there. I'm gonna have my on off here. The thing with switches, I don't know about you, when I play guitar, I beat the hell out of my guitars. I've been known to rip the neck off a Stratocaster, because I'm a little bit too violent. Uh, so the same thing with the switches, if you're really playing, you want them protected. So that is going to be in between those two, and that one's behind that, so that I can't knock it on or off by mistake. Uh, it might make it a little bit more difficult to get to, but it will mean that you have to actually consciously think about turning it on or off. And finally, we've got our little rotary encoder, which will be well, somewhere in that space, probably there making a triangle, because you've always got to think about what these things look like, don't you? It is absolutely essential that all of the electronics are shielded. And that goes for the control cavity and the guitar's basic volume and tone, etc. as much as for the X1 mini pad. Now, there is occasionally a strange effect caused by the LEDs cycle. It, it cycles on and off and through different, different colors, which is very pretty. But that can sometimes create a vroom, vroom sort of buzzing sound uh, that goes through the rest of the electronics of your, uh, well, it, it goes through into the amp. So we want to shield everything off to stop that. And there is one tiny, tiny little bit of soldering that can cut that out entirely if it becomes an issue at high gain. And uh, that's the only, in fact, I don't think Abtone Lab themselves know about this yet, because I haven't told them. Uh, but we, we discovered this recently. If you solder an earth to one of the positions, I can't get this open. I do enjoy playing around with uh, aluminium foil. The copper foil is prettier, but they all serve the same purpose. And then we need a sculpting plan.
basic electronics installation, gold screws this time. The only things that aren't going to be gold, unfortunately, are the switch and the button that come with this one move pad. There we go. Shielding the whole cavity as well. Now the beauty of this is we have an LED going into our cavity here. And uh, I'm sure that the LED sort of reflects a little bit. It's probably wishful thinking, but uh, it can't hurt, can it? I like LEDs. When you're using an aluminium foil like this, it's got a, a self-adhesive backing. That backing acts as a barrier in between the metal and this metal. So you need to fold that bit over so that it joins, otherwise your Faraday cage is no longer a Faraday cage and it's just random bits of metal. It will still be slightly effective at what it needs to be doing, but uh, not perfect. And perfection, perfection should be the goal, whatever one does. So, fold an edge over. It's a sticky little drop. And that edge will end up touching the metal on the bottom and creating electrical contact and eventually one homogeneous bit of shielding. Very shiny. Oh, this is blinding me. The afternoon sun is low in the sky and the poor luthier cannot see his work. There we go. The last bits and pieces. We routed a very specifically sized cavity for that touch screen. And we don't want any excess foil messing that up for us now. Okay, we have worked out that 59 millimeters is where we want to be, which is two and something-ish, somethings of an inch. Don't ask me, I know nothing. And uh, Jessica, Jessica is my brattle. She's one of my most used tools. And there we go. Now I know where I'm going to screw this down. Anton Lev have told us that we need to make sure these wires point this way, away from the electronics of the guitar, uh, in order to cut back on any feedback. I just need to cut away the excess so that I do have an access hole. Life without an access hole is bereft. There we go. Uh, I just need to pre-drill. Remember that I haven't, I've got quite a lot of space to play with here yeah. because it's absolutely essential. Now the X1 mini pad comes with a battery and various screws and a very fiddly little bag. Don't forget which way you want to point your your wires. Okay. The wires do sort of get a little bit in the way, but now I can slide that backwards and forwards. 48. So that is the middle. If you want, you can hold your ruler up diagonally between the screw holes, and it does. It lines up perfectly. You do need to bear in mind, if you don't want to do, it, to do any soldering, and soldering is actually relatively easy, um, the length of your wires. You don't want your controls to be too far away. Obviously, this is a plug and play system, and uh, yes, if you put everything too far away, then you're going to have to do some soldering. Let's wire this up. It's going to be really difficult. Oh, oh, that's wired. Excellent. I have tried to install this before and forgotten to take that off and actually have it in place. So that goes in. I love Remus. most useful. Now that is even safer. It means that you really just cannot hit it and knock it out of the way while you're uh, playing. Finally, the rotary encoder. 
Now, these rotary encoders, they like playing a trick on poor, unsuspecting guitar builders. You put this in, the, in your guitar, turn the instrument over to, I don't know, put a back plate on or something, and you get a, and it sounds like you've cracked something. It's just the switch. Don't worry, don't cry. Well, that was easy. Through all of this, we mustn't forget that I've got a battery to plug in. And the battery is going to be sitting in that cavity, wrapped in foam so it actually wedges itself in. There's only two screws to take off, and uh, it's not likely that somebody is going to be able to, well, screw this up. And this is where we need big holes. Number one and number four are rather large. And it's when you start plugging these things in that uh, life becomes just a little bit more interesting. Number four and number four. And, oh, that was a little difficult. Clicked in. Bear in mind that number one has the same size. So you do need to be careful that, uh, well, you get the right one in the right slot. 15 at both ends, that's 30 joints that you'd need to solder yourself. Amtan Lab have done this all for us, and it's amazing. Now, these can vibrate in the guitar and cause rattles. These are P-clips. In the very first video I did about the XY MIDI pads, one of the suggestions I made to them was that they put these P-clips in the kit. And they did. The power of a constructive review. So that's in there, and there's going to be less of a propensity for the hard things to rattle against each other. Now I need to figure out where I'm going to put the second one. This is a sticky backed foam that I have lots of in the workshop. I could have put a battery box in, but, well, as I discussed earlier, it's more fresh in your memory than it is in mine. Uh, I didn't like the look. Battery in, and it's just going to slip in there and uh, we're very lucky there is no way that that's going to move and it's going to be very easy to get out if required. Uh, there are metal clips that can go in cavities and things but uh, in this in this instance they're not absolutely necessary. This is a very small cavity. I've got to make sure all the wires are out of the way. My hold is actually just in line with the uh, switch. It's a, an ever so slight issue. And there we go. That's also, that is what that is going to look like. And there's going to be a black thing on there. How pretty. Tighten those up. Hey, we've got a battery in. Yeah. This is pretty much the only place you can really screw up, but it won't destroy everything. It'll just uh, mean you have to go back and put the ribbon back in. That little drawer there, you need a pointy thing. What a technical term. Just to pull that out as far as it goes. And it, it only comes out a millimeter. And the screen, that screen was the wrong way around. The white rectangle needs to be pointing to the back of the guitar. I love ribbon cable. It's very flexible. And that just sits in the drawer. Push it in. And then using your pointy thing, you push the door, drawer closed. And then that is locked in place. And you have, you have a screen, as you can see, that is reading and sending MIDI. Already, this is a light diffuser, which has dust on it. So that goes behind, behind the screen. What I tend to do is I push that ribbon cable in and then gently put the screen in. So that diffuses the cable. Diffuses the cable, diffuses the light. And Finally, just bolt that down. 
all of the preparation has left us with maybe half an hour of actual installation. The wiring process is the easy part of this. I can't say anything that you haven't seen already. This is much easier than it has every right to be. As I've just mentioned, this cavity is the tightest that I've had to install this bit of electronics in. And it has mooshed everything together in one small space. And this guitar is a perfect example of what can happen sometimes if all of the electronics are together. You can just hear a little buzz in the background from the amp. That's because I'm recording this at night with fluorescent lights all around the place. But the second I turn on the XY MIDI pad, can you hear that me buzz? And that's the data flowing, which is fine. To be honest, when you're doing this with an effect, you probably won't actually notice the extra buzz. But this is the most pronounced that I've ever seen it with one of these installations. And that's because I put everything right next to each other in the cavity. What I've done is I've soldered this wire to the main earth on my volume pot. And I've taken off the shielding that is on these two connectors, which is the on-off switch. Now the beautiful thing is that it doesn't matter which one of these you solder your earth to. Either way, you get rid of the, the horrible noise. I'm going to talk to Amtona Lab and I'm going to ask them if for future batches, pre-solder a wire to one of these tags and then just have an, an end left so that you can solder this to your, the earth of your guitar as standard. And I'm sure that they will oblige. I can just hear the data moving here, but there is no earthing problem. So now I can see if I can get all of this back in this control cavity. All right, it is quarter past one in the morning and we have been from just James here to demo the XY mini pad. Uh, he's driven four hours from a gig and uh, well, let's see what we can do. He's gonna be playing through a Digitech Whammy and a Cork Chaos Pad and well, it'll be good fun, let's see. <laughs> Using the drop tune feature on the uh, whammy pedal, you can use the hold button on here to remember the last place you touched. So, if we were to play an open E, we could then use the whammy pedal to pitch that down to exactly an E flat and hold it. So, now when we play it out through the speakers, So instead of having to detune the entire guitar, you can do it like that in a fraction of a second. The dive bomb feature is by far one of my favorite ones. You can pitch it down from three octaves up. So we start with a open note like that. By using an echo, we can pitch it down three octaves. Useful for any kind of blending you're gonna do.
are jumping onto the Chaos Pad. Um, the first ones that come up with the filters, they sound amazing through this. Jumping onto the second filter. Uh, this is like a high pass filter, so it will cut all the low end out of the sounds of the guitar. Um, this one's used a lot in studios. So if we use a hold function. gain coming through the chaos pad as well if you chain it through the gain on your current amp so you're using like double distortion
thus making the drummers obsolete. In the right hands, this is an amazing tool for the betterment of music kind. In the wrong, well, it's, it's, a, it's a toy. But, but we all like toys, don't we? Thank you for watching. I hope this has helped you uh, learn how to do the installation process and uh, answered any questions you might have had. It's much, much, much easier than by rights it should be. And, uh, well, you can take your guitar and start playing things like that with some practice and uh, a couple of amps and all of that. Anyway, thank you for watching. Check out the other videos that uh, Crimson Guitars have got and thank you to Premier Guitar Magazine. And it is now two o'clock in the morning. I'm going to bed. Thanks for watching. And good night. <laughs>